Okay, all right. If you have your Bible, if you have access to the scriptures, we please open them to Genesis chapter 44. Genesis 44. You know, someone has mentioned that a family is kind of like fudge, mostly sweet with a few nuts. <laughs> and apparently, many of you can relate. And, you know, uh, the fact truth of the matter is, when a family is clicking right, there is no blessing better than that. Am I right? But when it's not clicking right, there's nothing that hurts quite like that. Am I right? In fact, when things are wrong, when things are off, when a family fractures, For whatever reason, be it, I don't know, sometimes sibling rivalry can arise. Sometimes there will be be a dad that may make make poor choices or or is this disconnected. You know, know, so often in our kind of world, I'm just grateful for the good examples that we can find of healthy and and Christ-honoring families. Because too often, what do we see? We see fractured families. I remember one comedian saying, hey, I, the other night I went to a, a great family diner. Every table, there was argument. That's how we could tell it was a family restaurant. And it's meant to be ha-ha, but it kind of hurts, doesn't it? Because if we're really honest, we're familiar how that tension could be. In fact, sometimes talking about family relationships... Even weekend, like Labor Day weekend, when you have sometimes family members over, right? How many of you had family members or get together with family during this weekend? Okay, a few of you. But when it comes to bigger holidays, like Christmas, Thanksgiving, right? Sometimes we look forward to that, but sometimes at the same time we kind of have this tension in our chest because we want to see so-and-so. Right? And here's what we find in God's word. First of all, God invented the family. God created the family unit. It is to be the basis of human civilization. It is the basis. In fact, the church, the local church, is described as, a, as God's family. Because family is so important. And so what we're going to talk about today is we're going to talk about how God can maintain a family that's healthy with the truths that we're about to unpack. And if you're a family, or if you're experiencing tension, if you're experiencing issues, if you have that gap or that that hurt of, of a fractured family, God can heal that. In fact, today we're going to talk about how to fix a fractured family, according to God's word, because God can turn a hating family into a healing family. God can turn a bitter family into a blessed family. And again, we're going to find out these truths in Genesis chapter 44. Now, as we continue in our series through the life of Joseph, we notice a remarkable thing that God does in Joseph's family. And from this account, from this reading, we're going to learn God's important truths of how we can apply his truth and make a good family better and perhaps heal hurting families. So what we're going to do, normally we stand as we honor the reading of God's word, but today, in order for us to get to our focal passage, we're going to need to break down the, basically the almost entirety of Genesis chapter 44. So if you will just follow along, if you don't have access to Scripture, that's okay, because the passage is going to be projected for you on the screen. But I'm going to need to unpack this. And so I just want to kind of remind you how, what we kind of left off, right? Because last, we last remembered that the brothers were with Joseph at this time, and they were enjoying this incredible feast. They were having a good time, okay? So I'm going to pick up in Genesis chapter 44, beginning of verse 1. 
It reads, Now Joseph gave these instructions to the steward of his house. Fill the men's sacks with as much food as they can carry and put each man's silver in the mouth of his sack. Then put my cup, the silver one, in the mouth of the youngest one's sack, along with the silver for his, ga- for his grain. And he did as Joseph said. As morning dawned, the men were sent on their way with their donkeys. They had not gone far from the city when Joseph said to his steward, Go after those men at once, and when you catch up with them, and say to them, Why have you repaid good with evil? Isn't this the cup that my master drinks from and also uses for divination? This is a wicked thing you have done. Now, let me unpack this a little bit more. See, you got to understand that Joseph is setting up this event for the purpose of discovering how much his brothers have changed to see how close or fractured his, the family current condition may be, is, is, okay? So this is a setup, okay? Verse 6, when he, that's the steward, caught up with them, he repeated these words to them. But they said to him, why does my Lord say such things? Far be it from your servant to do anything like that. See, the brothers had no idea what was going on. They had no idea the issue, the problem. All they knew is they didn't do anything wrong, okay? In fact, they go on to give a very convincing reason why they're innocent. Verse 8, we even brought back to you from the land of Canaan the silver we found inside the mouth of our sacks. Why would we steal silver or gold from your master's house? If any of your servants is found to have had it, check this out. He will die, and the rest of us will become my Lord's slaves. In fact, they were so sure that they were innocent that they posed this very extreme condition. Okay? Verse 10. Very well, then, he said, let it be as you say. Whoever is found to have it will become my slave. The rest of you will be free from blame. Each of them quickly lowered his sack to the ground and opened it. Again, they did it real quickly. They're like, what's going on? It's no big deal. We're innocent. Here it is. Then the steward proceeded to search, beginning with the oldest and ending with the youngest. Remember, last week we talked about how doing this sequence is very much an indication that God was at work or information about them was known more than it was disclosed. And both were true, okay? Now, the steward proceeded, and the cup, verse 12 goes on to say, and the cup was found in Benjamin's sack. At this, they tore their clothes. Then they all loaded their donkeys and returned to the city. Joseph was still in the house when Judah and his brothers came in, and they threw themselves to the ground before him. And Joseph said to them, what is this that you've done? Don't you know that a man like me can find things out by divination? What can we say to my Lord, Judah replied? What can we say? How can we prove our innocence? God has uncovered your servant's guilt. We are now my Lord's slaves. We ourselves and the one who was found to have the cup. Now, let me pause and unpack this a little bit more before we move on. The phrase, God has uncovered your servant's guilt, is significant. You see, first of all, this wasn't a reference to to the guilt of them having that silver cup alone. See, by this time, God has awakened the brother's conscience. By this time, God was working in their lives to be right. Not just before him, but before one another. And at this point, they say in effect, when they say God has revealed our guilt, they're saying, no, 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 God has now uncovered our guilt. Not just for this silver cup, but for what we did to our brother Joseph 22 years ago. It was an admission to everything. And an important point that applies to our message for today, in terms of fixing our fractured families, is that the brothers recognize that though they did not deliberately take the cup, that cup was still found in Benjamin's sack. And that's why they revealed it as 
But God has. God has. He, this is something that's beyond just us. And like these brothers, here's the reality. When it comes to your family situation, you may not be guilty. You may not be the one in the wrong. But if we are going to find healing, if we're going to find, as God designs, a family that makes an impact for the glory of Jesus Christ, we must recognize that God is in the midst of that situation that you're in. See, it begins there. God's in the middle of it. All the pain you've gone through, and you felt like, you know, this is just, you know, this is just a mess. God's still in that. God still can do something powerful. God can still produce a silver cup, so to speak, is what I'm saying. And until we recognize that God can be engaged in our everyday activity and just show up in things that we did not expect, we will never experience the full healing that God intends for us and our families. But let me move on. Verse 17. But Joseph said, far be it from me to do such a thing. Only the man who was found to have the cup will become my slave. The rest of you go back to your father in peace. Now, Joseph, again, remember, this whole thing was a setup. To, to, to see the condition of their family's life. To see how close they are or how fractured they may be. So, because Joseph understood that the jealousy that these brothers used to have for the children of Rachel. You see, Rachel was Jacob's favorite wife. And as a result, by default, Jacob loved the sons of Rachel more than the other sons. Not a good situation, okay? Parents, we don't have favorites, okay? Or we shouldn't have favorites. Maybe I should say that. That's a recipe for fractured families. Okay? However, he wanted to know if that jealousy still remained. See, it was the jealousy that the brothers had for Joseph that caused them to, to put, basically, put Joseph in the verge of death, and they, in the kindness of their hearts, instead sold him off as a slave instead. So, is the jealousy still there? Did the brothers hate Benjamin, you know, Rachel's son, just like the brothers hated Joseph, Rachel's son. He was probably thinking, we don't know for sure, but he was probably thinking, well, if the jealousy is still there and the, the brothers just abandoned Benjamin to his care or his, quote, imprisonment and slavery, he was just going to take care of his brother. But he was hoping that it wasn't there. The jealousy wasn't there. He was hoping for a healed family. But this was all a means to see how the brothers would respond. Okay, let's pick back up in verse 18. Then Judah went up to him and said, Please, my Lord, let your servant speak a word to my Lord. Do not be angry with your servant, though you are equal to Pharaoh himself. My Lord asked his servants, Do you have a father or a brother? And we answered, We have an aged father, and there is a young son born to him in his old age. His brother is dead, and he is only he is the only one of his mother's sons left, sons left, and his father loves him. Then you said to your servants, bring him down to me so I can see him for myself. And we said to my Lord, the boy cannot leave his father. If he leaves him, his father will die. But you told your servants, unless your youngest brother comes down with you, you will not see my face again. So when we went back to your servants, my father, we told him that what my Lord had said. Then our father said, go back and buy a little more food. But we said, we cannot go down. Only if our youngest brother is with us will we go. We cannot see the man's face unless our youngest brother is with us. Your servant, my father, said to us, you know that my wife bore me two sons. One of them went away from me, and I said, he has surely been torn to pieces. And I have not seen him since. If you take this one from me too, speaking of Benjamin, and harm comes to him, you will bring my gray head down to the grave in misery. All right. 
Now the setup is complete. Now we've caught up to our passage that we're going to focus on, okay? And we're going to discover how God can maintain a healthy family. Or in some of our cases, how God can fix a fractured family. Because the truth be told, if statistics are true, most of us have family issues. So we're not talking about those people. We're talking about us. Okay? So if you are not married yet, write these principles down. You're going to need it for your future family. Don't forget it. These are the basis of a healthy family. Okay? The first thing we recognize according to Scripture is this. Recognize the value of the other. Recognize the value of the other. See, we see this truth unpacked for us in verse 30 and 31. Here's what it reads. So now if the boy is not with us when I go back to your servant, my father, if my father, whose life is closely bound up with the boy's life, sees that the boy isn't there, he will die. Your, servant, your servants will bring the gray head of our father down to the grave in sorrow. See, when a family begins to fracture, it's because one or several members of the family begin to devalue the other. And we no longer see the other and other people, other members of the family, and the way that God intends for us to see them. And rifts start happening, and friction, you know, <laughs> is experienced. And pain comes. And when pain comes, there's a temptation to go, oh, i got to protect me. And when we are in self-preservation, you know what we do? We don't look out for the other. And by default, we lower the value in practical terms of the other. You know, the reality is, it's not that we don't care about other people in our family. I I get it. Some families have hostility towards another. But when you have a fractured family, it usually isn't because you hate one another. It's just that we're not that connected. It's just that, it's that, it's just that we're not as, as together. It's kind of, I'm kind of reminded of the mother with a teenage daughter. This is what she says about her. Oh, she's very independent. She lives alone at our house. You know? And... It's, well, that's what I'm talking about. It's when a husband and wife, they're still married, but they're just not as together. And when I say things like that and and unpack things like this, there's a sense of, here, because all of us experienced things like that before. And you know what? When this happens in one family member, it has a ripple effect because families are supposed to be connected. They're supposed to be together. So while you may mess up, that mess up impacts negatively the rest. See, that's the thing about sin. Sin, while self-induced, is rarely self-contained. While self self-committed, rarely is it it limited to the self. That's why God hates sin so much. And so when we don't see the value of one another, that's where some of us kind of have a whatever attitude when it comes to uh, our family members. That's why you say things like, oh, you know, it's okay, but I'll try to make it. I'll try to take care of that. Like I said, it's not because we hate one another. It's not because we're not concerned about the other. It's just that we sometimes, the com- our compassion for the other has diminished. So what are you talking about? What's compassion? Here's what compassion is. Compassion is seeing the value in the other 
to put forth the effort to make things better with that person. See, when a family is fractured, sometimes we get to a point where we're like, it's just not worth the argument. It's just not worth the trouble. It's just not worth the bother. How many of you ever heard that before? Yeah. See, compassion is recognizing the value in the other to forgive that person and try again. And again, it's not easy. This isn't easy. See, because it's natural for us to be self-protective after you've been hurt. If you, especially if you're the innocent party of a fractured family. That's not natural. But God wants you to experience the supernatural. See, when he gets into the picture, he brings about the capacity to heal broken families. And he's able to expand and elevate your compassion. And what is compassion? Compassion is concern that acts. See, a lot of us are concerned, and we like to. We want to. We hope that. But compassion goes further. It really acts to do something to fix the situation. Where am I? Again, let's look at Judah's response in verse 30. So now if the boy is not with us when I go back to your servant, my father, and if my father, whose life is closely bound up with the boy's life. Now, this is a stark difference for, Jews, for Judah, rather. See, if you may recall, at the beginning of Joseph's story, it was Judah that engineered the selling of Joseph 22 years ago. Okay? See, Judah didn't see Joseph worth the trouble of treating him as a brother, much less keeping him as a brother. But as God worked in the life of Judah, his response toward Benjamin was different. Judah was in effect saying, please let Benjamin go. Don't make him a slave. Why? He is precious and valuable to our father. You see, ultimately, the way we can have supernatural response and have compassion the way we should is to see the value of anybody as Judah saw Benjamin as closely bound up and loved by the Father. And that's our Heavenly Father. See, when we fully understand that, that changes our perspective. And when we trust Jesus to empower us through the, through the Holy Spirit, it's then that we can be truly compassionate and have concern that acts, that can heal they could bring about good and blessing. You know, um, some of you may have heard a story about John Newton. And John Newton was known because he wrote the hymn Amazing Grace. It's a often played hymn. It's a popular hymn. And it speaks of God's incredible compassion for you and me. But what many people don't recognize is that John Newton had a backstory. See, John Newton's backstory is this. He was a man who lived a terrible life. In fact, he sought riches and fame, and he knew one of the best ways to get rich was to be engaged in the slave trade. So he found himself sailing in the northern coast of Africa, capturing Africans to sell. He did not value people. Because they were just a commodity. They were a means to an end. But after a terrible shipwreck, John had a face-to-face, a, quote, come-to-Jesus moment. And he responded to Jesus, gave his life to Jesus. And he learned about all that Jesus has done for him. And as a result, he recognized a different perspective a perspective that the Heavenly Father had for every person. And for the rest of his life, he sought to abolish slavery in England. And eventually, slavery was abolished in many ways through all of John Newton's efforts. 
The point being is, when we do experience God's amazing grace in our lives, we're given insight to truly see the value of other people as God sees them. When was the last time your first response through a, to an annoying situation be one of, God bless you, instead of, what? When was the last time somebody cut you off at I-75 and you went, God bless you? It's not easy, and it's not natural. But you are followers of Jesus Christ. That's what, if you're not a follower of Jesus Christ, that's why you need to follow him. Because you become an agent for good. You become a rare commodity on earth. Because you do not live and see and, and act and respond like other people do. See, so you begin to see other people as valuable people. And when you see your family members as your precious family members... That's how you can fix a fractured family. That's how God can make a difference in your life. But that's not all. I'm going to quote a, uh, a Three Musketeers slogan, okay? But here it is. Point number two. Adopt an all-for-one and one-for-all attitude. All-for-one and one-for-all. That's the attitude it takes, and that's the attitude we're unpacking, we're going to discover from Scripture, because that's what these brothers revealed. But that's not very common, again, in our kind of world, is it? It's kind of like, the, you know, the famous joke, you know, about two guys who went camping, and one of the guys said, hey, there's a bear outside, and the other guy starts putting on his tennis shoes. So the other guy goes, hey, man, why are you putting on your tennis shoes? You know you can't outrun the bear. Well, after the guy put on his tennis shoes and looked back at his friend and said, hey, I don't need to outrun the bear. I just need to outrun you. Right? And that's the attitude most people have in our kind of world. Right? I got to look after me. I got to take care of me. We are a self-serving, self-loving society. And far too often, we have allowed that attitude to come into the way we deal with our families. Okay? But God teaches us the contrary. A all for one and one for all type attitude. Because and if we are going to see how God fixes our fractured family, that's what we got to adopt. See, we see different, several examples of this in the passage we read. For example, in verse 13, At this, they tore their clothes, then they all loaded their donkeys and returned to the city. Again, let's contrast that to the way the brothers treated Joseph 22 years ago. You see, you may remember, when Joseph disappeared, it was only Jacob, Joseph's father, who tore his clothes. But now, all the brothers tore their clothes. See, in the beginning, they had contrived to get Joseph to Egypt. This time, they all voluntarily went back to Egypt. You see? A huge and market, market, noticeable difference. Take a, take a look at verse 16. What can we say to my Lord, Judah replied? What can we say? How can we prove our innocence? God has uncovered our, your servant's guilt we are now my Lord's slaves, we ourselves, and the one who was found to have the cup. See, Judah didn't say, well, tough luck for Benjamin, the cup's found in his sack. He's your slave now, right? No. He said, we are guilty. In fact, in that verse alone that I just quoted, verse 16, Judah talked about we twice. Benjamin once. That's the thing. If we are to see God fix our families, we gotta, it's got to be all together. We're all in for one another. All for one and one for all. And this concept, 
is a very biblical one because it's the one that Christians, all of us, should share for one another. For example, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 26, it says this. If one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. Now, the immediate reference is to the, is to the body of Christ, which is the church. But it's also for the individual family, which is a basic representation of the family of God. And this is further emphasized in Romans chapter 12, verse 15, where it says, Rejoice with those who rejoice and mourn with those who mourn. See, this all for one and one for all attitude is not just vital for the church. It's not just applicable for every single follower of Jesus Christ. It's indispensable if God is going to fix our fractured families. Now, some of you are thinking, okay, Talon, what does it look like tangibly to have this attitude? Well, it's found in verse 33. Now then, please let your servant remain here as my Lord's slave in this place, in, the, in place of the boy, and let the boy return with his brothers. Judah is saying, take me instead. I'll be the slave. Please let him go free. See, what does this attitude look like in practical terms? Sacrifice. Sacrifice. See, that's the heart of having an all-for-one and one-for-all attitude. And it shouldn't surprise us. It shouldn't surprise us. Even this weekend that we celebrate, Labor Day weekend, see, what made our nations as great as our nation is, and again, Our nation is not perfect, right? We get that. But we also need to recognize it's still the greatest nation in human history. That's a fact. And we should be grateful to God for it. Because if you've been outside this country, you know. Okay? Don't let anybody else tell you otherwise. But these things... What we, the freedoms that we experience today is a result of the sacrifice of those who've come before us. And the greatest freedom that any of us can experience, which is freedom from the consequence of our sin, is because of what Jesus has done for us, his sacrifice. You see, the Son of God loved you so much thought you were so valuable. Not because we are, because he deemed us so. He has chosen to love us. He shed his sinless blood on a cross for you and for me. See, it's because of his sacrifice that we can have life. It's because of his sacrifice that we can be free to be everything God created us to be. It's because of his sacrifice that we can have life and life everlasting. You see, what makes a difference in the world as a Christian certainly makes a difference in a broken family. And it just takes sacrifice. It just does. Now, I'm not saying at all that we should be a doormat. We should not take abuse Because tragically, some family members can be very abusive. That is not what the Word of God teaches us. Certainly, we should not ever compromise God's Word and sacrifice His Word, His truth, His principles. No, that's not what I'm talking about. But here's what I am talking about. Like dads, for the sake of the healing of the family, it may mean your hobbies change and you sacrifice not watching the game for the sake of the family, right? Something can be tangible like that. It could be not taking that job because it would impact your time with your family. See, it could be just for all of us, the sacrifice of, of, of laying down our pride so that the family can be built up. See, God wants to do amazing work in you and amazing work in us. And one of the best testimonies of the reality of Jesus Christ is a healthy, 
God-honoring, Christ-centered home. And sometimes it takes sacrifice as we reflect Jesus. But last but not least, conduct your life to please the Father. These are the principles, if we'll engage, if this can be a reality in our lives, our families can be made whole. It can be healed. Conduct your life to please the Father. See, herein lies the motivation of why we would follow the truths found today, as well as the reason and the motivation to obey anything that Scripture tells us, to please the Father. Where am I getting this? Verse 34, it says this. How can I go back to my father if the boy is not with me? No, do not let me see the misery that would come upon my father. Verses 18 through 34 is the longest and considered most impassioned speech in all of the book of Genesis. In fact, many biblical scholars describe these verses with words like this. For example, Dr. Driver, a biblical scholar, said this, these verses represent a speech of singular pathos and beauty. Another noted scholar, Dr. Skinner, had this to say. It is the finest specimen of dignified and persuasive eloquence in the Old Testament. See, it's important to note that within these verses, Judah mentions Father, 14 times. The point is obvious. The focus or the motivation behind what Judah was about was pleasing his father. See, 22 years earlier, he could have cared less what his father thought. See, since his father has always shown favoritism to Joseph instead of to them, the very engineering by Judah of Joseph being sold as a slave was an indirect act of cruelty committed against his father. See, 22 years ago, when Jacob was crying over what he thought was the death of his son, Joseph, because of the bloody, torn-up robe, Jacob was in anguish. Now, Judah, 22 years later, he's willing to do anything in order for his father not to be in anguish again. The lesson is this. You and I need to conduct our lives in order to conduct our heavenly father. Let me ask you this question. How are we doing in conducting our lives and living our lives? When was the last time you prayed, Heavenly Father, is this what pleases you? If it is, I'll do it. If it's not, I won't. No matter what the sacrifice. When was the last time you prayed something like that? When was the last time you lived in light of that filter? And, and basically, you're all about pleasing the Father. <laughs> Is this something my Heavenly Father wants me to do? I'm doing it. I'm, I'm, I'm in. I'm down with that. If he's not, I, it doesn't matter how much money I lose. It doesn't matter how, what, what friends I may be strained from. I'm not doing it. Because I'm not about anything but pleasing the Father. See, if we're really honest, too many quote-unquote followers of Jesus, they believe in God, but they're about themselves. They just use Jesus to leverage him to get what we want. Let's just be honest. I'm just asking the Lord to bless me with this job, with this with this raise, with this family, with this relationship, Lord, just do that for me. And the question I would ask you is this. When was the last time you simply said, Father, what is it that you want? What is it that you want? 
See, when you recognize how much he loves you, when you fully understand the sacrifice of giving up his one and only son, Jesus Christ, to be brutally murdered for us, that's when we begin to understand how great he is and how totally worth it it is for us to say, Father, I can't believe you love me this much. And the rest of my life is to enjoy your love for me, and I'm going to do what pleases you out of gratitude. Because I know I don't deserve it. But you did it for me anyway. <sighs> See, when was the last time you were blown away by the love of Jesus? Or are you so over that? Far too many of us, we've, been, we've gotten over what Jesus has done for us. And I get it. In our kind of world, it's natural to let these things affect us to where we get distracted from what we need to be focused on. But we're not called to live a natural life. We're called to live a supernatural life. It's a life where Jesus becomes the central focus and the filter to which we do and see everything. And in light of that, like Jesus, do what pleases the Father. See, it was because Jesus chose to please the Father that when he prayed at the garden, he said, not my will, but yours be done, because the crucifixion is not something pleasant to go through. But he did it for you. And to, most importantly, to please the Father. You know, um, this is what, this type of response is what makes a questioning world look at us and go, there is something different about you. There is something different about you. Because this is not normal. And that's what I'm going to ask us to do. Go beyond normal to what God wants to do in your life, which is extraordinary. Let me close with this story. I read a story about Daniel. His name is uh, Max Lucado, a Christian author, wrote about him. Daniel was one of those bodybuilder types, and his dream was to own his own gym and you know, have his own business like that. And and he was close to a dream, but in order for him to start his own gym, he had to get a loan from a bank. And the banker said, hey, only way for us to guarantee that amount of money is you have to have a co-signer. So what he did is he asked his brother, and his brother said, yeah, I'll sign with you. And so after a few, several days, uh, the banker said, hey, everything's good. You just need to come over to the bank and pick up the check. The loan is secured. Well, Daniel excited, goes to the bank. And the banker said, hey, what are you doing here? And Daniel said, well, I'm here to pick up the check. He said, well, that's funny. Your brother was here earlier. Here he signed and picked up the check, and he used the check to pay off his mortgage to uh, free up his own house. Daniel was upset. No, he was mad. You see, being a bodybuilder, he's one of those guys who could literally crush a man to death. And that's what he wanted to do with his brother. And it was messed up. And so for about two years, he didn't want to mess with his brother. In fact, right afterwards, he went to the brother's house to demand his money back. But this is what his brother did. He brought up one of his children, placed the child in front of him because he knew his brother Daniel was about to kill him. And surely Daniel wouldn't kill him in front of his own children. And Daniel didn't. But he left saying, I'm done. I'm done with you. You are not my brother anymore. I'm done. But two years have passed. And during the two years, he met a missionary. And in 
that meeting, he learned about Jesus. And hearing about Jesus and all that he has done, his love, his great forgiveness, and the reality of all of our sin, because all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Here's what happened. Daniel became a Christian. Daniel was changed. Now, he still had trouble dealing with his brother. Still had issues. But he knew eventually he's going to meet his brother again, see his brother, and that they finally came. They were walking down the city. Daniel was walking, and he saw his brother. In a brief instant, his brother saw him, and his brother ran. <laughs> And Daniel took off after him. Now, not only was he a bodybuilder, but he was a very good athlete. He runs him down, grabs his brother by the shoulder, and spins him around. And his brother winces, expecting the punch, you know? But you know what Daniel did instead? He hugged him. He hugged him. And they both of them stood in the middle of the street, in the middle of the city, and they just wept. And when Daniel was asked later, what made you do that? He said, when I turned my brother around, I no longer saw my enemy. I saw the man who had my father's eyes, who had my father's smile. I saw the face of my father. And he was my brother again. You see, the healing this world needs, the healing our family needs, is, has everything to do with him. He is our answer. And I'm going to ask you, will you give yourself to please the Heavenly Father? Because he was pleased to love you.